I felt that nostalgia that I was talking about, you know, I felt exactly that way. As you all know, uh, the issue of uh, creation of memoirs has not been one that has had much of a, a lifespan in, uh, as a genre in Iranian uh, literature. Uh, but in recent years, especially in the last couple of decades, we've been really uh, blessed with a huge number of memoirs, most of them by women. And it leads us to think uh, whether some uh, uh, interesting cataclysmic events uh, have a role in wanting people to tell about the changes that have happened to them. And uh, as the uh, uh, late uh, beloved poet uh, Nader Naderpul used to say, uh, the recent revolution uh, sort of was like a, a tablecloth being pulled from under uh, a table full of uh, uh, various objects. Everything has changed its place. Everything has been replaced and reorganized. And so it goes for everyone's lives. And I suppose to, do, to write memoirs is one way of dealing with that, to creating a new identity or understanding the old identity or relating the two together. My, my memoir really begins in 1974 or 1975 and ends in 1984. And those were 10 years, a slice of time in the life of Iran that I thought was profoundly important um, the transformation from pre and post, you know, from pre to the revolutionary time to the post-revolutionary era um, had been uh, 10 years that um, not only changed me, but as we all, I'm sure, agree here, uh, transformed Iran and, you know, by extension, I think, uh, transformed the region and the rest of the world and so on and so forth. Um, I, as a result, I, I suppose in response to, to the question that's put before us, um, I wrote because I wanted to um, provide a different narrative about what had happened in Iran. Uh, I had three major objections to the narrative that, that um, as an Iranian-American, hyphenated Iranian-American, living in the United States on the East Coast, uh, I was encountering. And, and um, being uh, also Jewish, um, the, the th <coughs> at least the, the narrative that I was encountering had three dimensions. One was that um, even in encounter with American Jews, um, what, especially when I first came to the United States, uh, the, the first question that I would get after hearing that I was Jewish was, are there Jews in Iran? Well, yes, of course. <laughs> That's where I come from, the, so we, we must be there. Um, um, and, and so the question obviously offended me, especially because considering the roots of, of the Jewish community in Iran, which predates the, the roots of the Muslim community in Iran, I thought, you know, how silly that, um, you know, American Jews don't know that Iranian Jews are there and have been there longer than most others. Um, the second aspect of the narrative, uh, which was circulating, which was important for me to uh, debunk or challenge or uh, provide an alternative to was um, the, the narrative about women, you know, that, that um, women in Iran must be um, <laughs> creatures who are uh, subdued, um, incapable, incompetent, um, without a voice, which <laughs> again, for most of you who are in this room, um, is clear that that was not the case. Um, and again, you know, it, or, or at least the, the, the answer was far more complex than the one that was circulating. Um, and the third was that the Iranian revolution, or what happened in Iran, was uh, an entirely Shiite fundamentalist um, e event. And that, um, uh, and, and that, that one uh, image of um, angry people throwing their fists into the cameras uh, chanting death to America in front of the, the television cameras um, is really the only Iran, and the Iran that basically overwrites and redefines everything else that came before. And so I decided to write because uh, all of these three uh, images circulating about uh, who I was, um, each involving one different dimension, really offended me. And um, so I wrote to, uh, to try to set the record straight or at least provide an alternative narrative 
for the national narrative? I did not plan to write a memoir at all. I left Iran when I was 11. I'm half Iranian. I grew up very half and half. I lived in Iran until the revolution. And came to America and had uh, probably the typical traumas of a 12-year-old trying to adjust after that during the hostage crisis. In which case, I basically put Iran aside for about eight or nine years, and I really embraced America. And it wasn't until college that I really started revisiting Iran again. And so I took Farsi class with Jean Pierre Nez. I don't know if she's here. <laughs> But, um, but I also reconnected with my Iranian relatives and started becoming interested in them and started becoming interested in writing and using them as, as fodder for my creative writing class. It was a fiction class, and so I would change everyone's names, but I would basically go to Mehunis and write down what happened in them and not change everything, and, and people were very entertained by it. So uh, I had professors saying, oh, you know, you should write a memoir. And when I went to journalism school, they were saying, you should write a memoir. And being 25 years old, I said, you know, no, I don't, you know, I don't have a memoir to write. But when I went back to Iran the following year, when I was 26, I, I re-entered a world that I had lost. And Iran for me, for the last 15 years, had become a mythical land. It had become this wonderful place of memories that we could never go back to, and you only heard stories about people having to escape dressed as sheep over the mountains, um, you know, nine-year-old boys sent off to war, I mean, all the horror stories that we all know. So to return there was a real reintegration for me. And that was the point at which I thought that I could write a memoir, because there was an arc. There was a story of beginning in one place and being torn away from that place, and embracing a new place, and then going back to the original spot. And within that, it was a story of Iran that, like Roya said, had really been hijacked by very few people, by the media. Um, it was an Iran, the Iran that I saw in 1993 was very different from anything that we had seen. Oh, sorry, is this not loud enough? The Iran that we knew from the media was very different from anything that I saw in Iran, I mean, you know, the, the warmth and the, the, the kind of fascinating subcultures and the way that people there are normal people just like everywhere else. And so I think that that really was a motivation for both of us to write the memoir. But for me, it also helped me re-embrace my Iranianness and the process of writing it um, really enabled me to reconnect with Iran and with what had happened to our family and the, the kind of dispersion of our family that had occurred. And also, we can talk about this more later, it, it allowed me to connect with an Iranian community that I had not been connected to in the past. So that is my basic reason for, for having written it. I really felt, you know, sort of a momongoli. <laughs> <laughs> and especially the, the old dear friend said today, you look like a hot mama. <laughs> <laughs> and in Iran, I'm also the Salam mother. And so um, I'm sort of felt out of place. But at the same time, I was, you know, had such a maternal admiration for these two young uh, writers. And I was very happy, you know, to share this panel with them. As for me, my case is completely different. I have been an Iranian, and I am an Iranian. I have all those, at the age of 16, my father sent me to America and said that just go and make something out of yourself, like the way I did. Don't come to me, I won't give you a penny. So, because he really believed that, you know, in America you can become, you know, you can make your life and stand on your own feet. And I, I went to high school, and then I went to university, then I turned, of course, I returned to Iran, and for the last 30 years, after, you know, the very same year of the revolution, I went to Paris, and ever since, I go back to Iran. But I, 30 years I've been living in, in, in France, but it, it has touched me, I have learned a lot of things, the language, the culture, but deep down, the, I'm so Iranian that I, I just get sick and tired of myself. You know, why don't I change a little? So <laughs> I wanted to, 
to write stories, actually. But stories, the characters I picked up from my family. Because I have such a, I have this privilege of such a, to have a, such an extraordinary family that each one of them is, is a real character of a good novel, especially my father, you know. My maternal family, they were extremely modern and civilized and they laughed and they didn't say anything. They didn't make any objections, you know, because I've sort of, you know, teased my uncles a lot, exaggerated with a little reality and fiction. But uh, my, my father's family, you know, they're quite different. My aunts lived in city of Rome, they're traditional and uh, we were afraid of them a little. <laughs> and so my brother said that, leave, leave them alone, you know, <laughs> leave them alone. And I said that, well, I'm a writer, I can do whatever I want. And he said that, no, you, you did enough. You did enough with everybody and everybody was so nice and nobody said anything, but the, leave them alone. So I, I said, well, I'm not gonna leave them alone. Because I've, I had written these stories, and in English, you know, it's, it's translated, you know, also it's called the, the ladies in French. In French, it's called the aunts. So I said, okay, I don't say I'm the aunt, I will, the aunts, I will say the ladies. Because the first sentence starts with, uh, father says, beware, the wolves are coming. <laughs> so... So I said the ladies came and I didn't say from where, I just changed the cities, you know, and I said I don't, I never knew what relation we had with them, and then, then I went on and I said whatever I wanted. If, if writing about a family, I said, you have to assume, you have to accept the consequences. Fortunately, the maternal part, they were nice enough, I remember my uncle just called me from America, I mean your father. <laughs> that was laughing and saying that, oh, Goli, you know, if I see you, they were just reading your story in the radio, and you said that my uncle, he was a colonel, and I said he was afraid of horses. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he said that, oh, you know, but he laughed, they all laughed, it was so sweet, because I said that he, he gave up the army and stayed home making uh, good, um, jam, you know, confiture, and then he said that, but he laughed, he took it as a really nicely. So this is, this is it, this is what really happens. But for me, then when, when, when the story there was finished, it was so necessary for me as if, it was, for me writing this story, this, this memories of the past, what had a therapeutic effect, as if I had once more to go back to the roots and come back and close the door to the past. Because this nostalgia of the past, uh, uh, I, it's not good. It's, it's some sort of sickness, it can paralyze you. Just always to looking back and not jumping. It keeps you from you know, the flow of time towards future. So uh, although I wrote my memories, I'm not, you know, I finished with the past. The past is in me, in, in all of us, like our childhood. But we have to let it go and go with another dimension of time. Thank you.